What's going on, folks? Happy Friday. We are about to get it on and popping. We are Friday Night Live on Pro Fan Talk. What's going on? Bob Brown, first out the limo. What's going on? 88's in the building. Jason Sink, my guy. What's going on, guys? Bow 316. <laughs> it's here in Europe and Asia. Yeah, we need to find that dude that was uh, dri driving the Bugatti this afternoon, right? But what's going on, my people? Um, we are two weeks away from the draft, so it is mock draft season. Isn't that fun to say? But that's what we are doing right now. And as I always tell you guys, if you are the smartest man in the room, find a new room. So I never claim to be the smartest guy when it comes to the draft and stuff like that. You guys know my philosophy. Find guys that watch tape. Find guys that study film. I'm a big fan of Brian Baldinger. Uh, Baldy was a was a teammate of mine with the Eagles. Uh, you know I like Greg Cosell. You know I like Barrett Brooks. And I got this guy right here, Ian Cummings from Pro Football Network. He is in the building. Ian, what is going on, my friend? Nothing much. Just uh, getting uh, closer to the draft. We're finally on the home stretch. It feels like it's been forever, this cycle in particular. You know, we've been talking about these guys for months on end now, but um, it's fun. We're, I'm excited to see what happens. Putting my name in the conversation is those names feels feels a little, you know, I, I got to give credit. You know, those guys have a step up on me, but I'm trying to trying to close the gap a little bit. So I appreciate the chance to come on. It's always good to talk ball with you. Absolutely, man. Uh, my first question I have for you is, um, are you sleeping? I'm trying to. I'm trying to. We're trying to keep it balanced there for sure. But now, you know, I got my big board that I'm finalizing on Monday or Tuesday next week. I think end of day Monday. So I'm trying to I'm going to have to get a little extra work in just to make sure that I cross my T's and dot my eyes on that on that front. But um, I'm trying to, you know, I think a good solid five or six hours is all you need this time of year. And then, you know, that once May hits like, hey, I'm, I know I'm blocking off a week for vacation. Just just like that. Right. So, you know, it's going to come in time, but we've still got some work to do. Right, man. And and the one thing, the one thing I always say, especially about when it comes to watch and take, because it is quite clear these days, me and Barry Brooks were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. It is very easy to tell who watches tape and who doesn't. That is getting very, very clear now when you see people uh, with their reports, all of the media heads on ESPN and all that kind of stuff, man. Um, you can tell the people that watch tape and then the people that just get a stack of papers with numbers on them. You know what I mean? So I, I always appreciate guys that do the film study like yourself and like the others I mentioned. Um, it's very important now because because the way social media is and everybody's getting stuff from everywhere, um, it is very easy to figure out who is watching the tape, man. And when you see these guys put out all of these prognostications and all of that kind of stuff, and at the end of the day is like, regardless of how much tape you watch you're still kind of guessing you know what i mean because you never know what's going to happen so yeah and i i think that's the the important thing to have in your head as you're watching the tape too like you don't know what's going to happen with these guys like as much as you can watch and kind of diagnose what's on the tape what they do mm -hmm. well what they don't situation landing spot supporting cast like there's a lot of factors that go into it that go even beyond the tape so i think the, the first thing for being a draft analyst right is knowing like hey there's still a lot I don't know. Even when I do this really comprehensive evaluation, we're just right. trying to get the best guess here. Right. Do you see um, anything crazy happening within the first 10 picks? You think anybody jump up, jump down? I mean, I know it's a possibility, but, mm -hmm. you know, just from your perspective, your opinion? Yeah, I, it's 
I, it's a tough question because I think that I, I think the entire top ten could be crazy. Well, we'll see. I think I mean Caleb Williams. It feels like he's going to go number one of the Bears right now. Yeah. I think that's basically what we're expecting to happen. But after that, the floodgates open, man. I mean, I have no idea. The, the Commanders, it'll be Daniels or May probably with that, and then the Patriots. I assume they'll pick whoever's left between those two guys. Maybe JJ is in the mix. Yeah. There's been rumors that maybe he's going up there. He's still my QB four, but I can see why teams would like him that high. He's young. He's talented. We could see four quarterbacks go top four, which is crazy. I don't know if I, – I can't cross-check off the top of my head, but I don't know if it's happened before, um, which, you know, the positional value, the QB tax, we know it's important. We know it matters. We know it's there every year. So I can see why it would be driven up, right? But, you know, you got the Cardinals and the Chargers. Who's going to win out on the trade-down front? Because it feels like both of them want to trade down. It's right. just a matter of where teams who are QB needy, where are they going to trade up to, four or five? I, I, I would assume four because you box everyone out with that right it's going to be difficult who's the first receiver off the board is Malik neighbors going to be wide receiver one is he going to sneak in or is it going to be mhj um you know what do the bears do with that ninth overall pick what do the falcons do with the eighth the titans do they get the best offensive tackle so i think there's a lot of wild cards i think it all starts with the qbs at the top and what happens with that group that's kind of you know the precipitant for everything else but um to answer your question in a short summation you know is it going to be crazy i think i think it's only going to be crazy this year it's going to be fun do you uh I, I heard you mention um Malik Neighbors. You got him going before Marvin Harrison Jr.? I don't have him personally going before MHJ is my wide receiver one. He's my top non-quarterback in the entire draft. So I'm still in the MHJ wide receiver one camp. But we have, you know, we've been seeing little whispers here and there that some teams might have neighbors over MHJ, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they're close enough where maybe there could be a wild card in there, right? I think it depends stylistically on what you want at wide receiver, right? I think MHJ is the most complete receiver in the draft, but Malik Neighbors is that three-level weapon, super explosive after the catch on the vertical plane. Um, and I think that could be appealing to a lot of teams too. I if if I'm a betting man, which I'm not, I'm pretty frugal, right? So I'll stay, mm -hmm. I'll stay away from that. I'll let other people do that. But if I was a betting man, I, I'd still lean toward MHJ going number one just because the tape is so good, man. Yeah. Is he is he your slam dunk for the for, for this year and the prospects? I mean, it feels like a cop out because it's an easy slam dunk to choose, yeah. right? You know, you, you want to put you want to put some more stake in it, but um, no, yeah, I mean, for sure, he's the highest receiver that I've ever graded. Um, you know, he's it's tough, man. It's really tough to poke holes in his game. Six foot three, two oh eight, and I think how flexible he is and how nuanced he is as a route runner. Right. That's really what won me over, which is which is interesting because the athleticism is almost secondary to his game, which he's a legit athlete. Like he, you didn't he you didn't need testing numbers to know that. You look at the film; he's explosive. He can stack guys with the speed. He's very agile as well, very fleet footed. But it's the way he applies that, both as a catcher, right? You know, mm -hmm. at the catch point with the body control and the instincts, the route running nuance, the flexibility, the ability to you know use throttle control and bend and, and sharp tempo modulations to offset DBs, target of physicality he really is the full package right and i think the one question i had heading into 2023 was we didn't see a ton of rack production run after the mm -hmm. catch in 2022 and i think they schemed him more opportunities there and we really saw what that long strider speed can do in open space he can legitimately warp tap tackling angles so i think you know Every question I had, he answered it pretty well. He's very right. high on my board, highest receiver I've graded. And it's tough because Malik Neighbors in any other class would be wide receiver one. Roma yep. Dunze in any, any other class would be wide receiver one. But I, I think it speaks to just how talented the class is at the very top. Now, when you see guys like this, like Marvin Harrison Jr., because for me, he is somebody truly where I would say, what are you gonna what are you gonna learn at a combine that you haven't seen on tape? And that's the one question that I always have. Um for people that watch film or um not for somebody like you because i i know you do the homework you know what i'm saying but you you watch the shows and all of a sudden somebody comes out of nowhere or somebody shows you something and i'm like you cannot um you cannot put more value on what you saw in the workout than what you saw you know 12 games on the field in real situations in real pressure against real talent and it's, it seems like every year you're always going to have people that, that get to the combine and they jump out of the gym. I, I always think of Anthony Richardson is the, the best recent example. Um, or, you know, like Xavier Worthy. He was a good receiver, but then you saw that 40 time and you were like, damn, you mm -hmm. know, that is that is bad, that is past fast. But you always see these guys and it's like, what didn't you see in the film? Like, 
I asked the question, what didn't you see in Brock Purdy? And all of a sudden he comes out of nowhere. Like, why is it always people that miss like that? It's a tricky question. And my philosophy for the NFL combine has always been, you want it to be a cross checking tool, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, you never want to be discovering a player there. And I, it, it's tough because there's so much ground to cover, especially these right. past few years, because we've had the COVID year. So players have been going back and returning and using the extra eligibility. So these classes have been a little bit deeper on the back end. So there's a lot of ground to cover. I'm not going to pretend to be any kind of superhuman, right? Like I can't watch every single player who's at the combine before the combine hits. So naturally, right. sometimes your first impression is going to be those testing numbers, right? So I think the key thing for draft analysts, right? You know, working within that lens, you know, human perception is flawed, you know, just by nature, right? So right. you kind of have to understand that if your first impression to a player is that 40 yard dash time or that vertical, right? Let's say it's a 40 inch vertical. The first thing you're think thinking is, oh, okay, he's explosive, right? right. But you, you got to cross check it with the tape because some guys are more explosive than their testing numbers some guys are less explosive right some guys channel that functional athleticism better some aren't quite able to do that and then you know once you cross check then you can ask the question of why right you know is it something that has to do with technique can he glean more of it with technical improvement right or is it an injury thing right where he's just not as comfortable in in-game situations so i think the the nfl combine the, the key is uh, you know, the key to the, answering that question is understanding that there's no succinct answer, right? You're not going right. to learn everything you want to learn from the combine drill. you got to cross check it with the tape, right? And it's great to have those numbers to cross check and fill all the gaps, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. And I think, you know, all roads need to lead back to the film because that gives you the ultimate answer of how it's applied in a real, real time football game. That's the most important thing. Right. Right. Now I'm looking, um, just following all the news here with the birds are you in philadelphia in the area no Our i'm a, i'm in i'm in michigan yeah okay, yeah, I'm, okay. A, I'm in michigan gotcha um like my day one possibilities because i'm thinking um the eagles are probably going to look at how he's either going to go i think he is probably going to draft the offensive tackle i think he's going to end up with uh tyler guyton from oklahoma unless he decides he wants to go up a little bit yeah um but I'm a big fan. I, I would really like to see them get Cooper DeGene. But you also get Nate Wiggins. You also get Kool-Aid. Um, and I was looking. I saw a lot of a lot of talk about Nate Wiggins today. And I'm like, I like his speed. And I, and, but I, to me, I'm like, is he too small? Because we need physical, we need physical cornerbacks. Because I'm looking at what happened when last time CJGJ was here, like um, Avante Maddox getting hurt. Sidney Brown getting hurt. I mean, Sidney Brown was a knee injury, so you can't really say that. But the guys, we, I guess I'm, I don't, I'm scared of those cornerbacks that are so small that when it comes to making tackles, they're going to have to make business decisions, and I, and I don't want to see that because we were so horrible at tackling last year. What what do you think about Nate Wiggins? Yeah, I think, um, and it's tough because of the Vic Fangio scheme, right? To you know, a yeah. lot of you know exotic blitz looks where corners are playing zone, so they're kind of, uh, you know, playing overhang and they're trying to capitalize on mistakes that the QB makes and pressure insights that, right? So you know, you want corners who can flow downhill with confidence, with physicality, right? Can trigger with with confidence, and I think Nate Wiggins is interesting because he does have that confidence and support. I do think yeah. for a guy who's a little bit leaner, I think he plays a little bit bigger than his size, and he's it's not just that he's leaner too you know he's around 6'2 but he's only got i think 30 inch something 30 inch arms right so right. You know, not great proportional length either and that shows up when he needs to engage and deconstruct blocks heading downhill too so i think with nate wiggins you definitely see that support urgency right you know everyone points out i think it was against clemson or against north carolina my bad he's he plays for clemson uh, that's how how jumbled my mind is this time <laughs> of year i'm just trying to get to the finish line You're but doing um, better than most bro I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But yeah, you you could see it the the um the makeup speed, right? When he has room to open up his strides, that's where that really shows up and that range and support is really special. But but the lighter frame, the lacking play strength, the below average length, all of those things show up as well too when deconstructing blocks. So, it's not something that makes him a liability by any stretch, but if you're Philadelphia and you want a stronger corner, I think mm -hmm. Cooper DeGene makes a lot of sense and to that end too. Cooper DeGene has been projected as a safety by a lot of people and myself yeah. included. I think most schemes he would fit better as a safety just because I think, you know, six foot over 200, he, he'll play closer to 210. He weighed in the two, four, 204 at the pro day. But, um, you know, at, at almost 210, 
a little bit muscle bound. The hips can be a little stiff on really sharp redirections. And that shows up on film when he needs to sink and redirect very quickly. But um, explosive, rangy. I mean, no one questions that. And I think, right. you know, when he's in side saddle and zone and he can play with his eyes to the QB, his read and react is phenomenal. His ball skills, phenomenal, right? This dude is a playmaker through and through. Instinctive cover man with some of the best read and react route recognition, you know, just ability to know what's coming and adapt and, you know, kind of be proactive in that sense. Very impressive on that end. So I think Cooper DeGene, you're looking at a guy who has a ton of safety conducive traits, but in the right scheme, right? I think a Vic Fangio scheme where he can play zone and side saddle a little more often, you could right. stick him to the boundary. And I think he'd be good there. You could you could rotate him into slot and safety based on situational uh, factors, right? And he play support too. So, you know, I think thinking about the physicality aspect, Nate Wiggins, I think can be a really good player. I think in coverage, right. his his agility, his fluidity, right? You know, his really smooth athleticism, the recovery speed, again, route recognition is a strength for him too, right? And he's got the playmaking ability. But when I think about complete defensive playmakers, I want a guy who can get in the scrum and deconstruct blocks and make plays behind the line. I want guys who can enforce downhill. I want guys who can compete at the catch point, right? And kind of, you know, play through the catch and, and you know, use that play strength to their advantage in 50-50 situations. And to me, Cooper DeGene is a little bit better fit for that. So it, there's some tricky parts about projecting him to a certain position. But I think if you can get him in the right situation, which the Philadelphia Eagles would be one of those, you can play him wherever and just be confident that he's going to make plays for you. Right. And I think that's... I think that's my plus for him because he is the he is the hybrid. You can put him in a bunch of different positions, especially after everything that happened to us last year in the secondary. I mean, we were put together with bubblegum and masking tape, man, and it was mm-hmm. it, it showed. Um, you know, it, 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 our defense was bad, very bad at the end. Um, so we 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 got to get better in that situation. And I'm one that like even right now. Um, I am of the opinion that right now, today, our defense is better than it was at the end of last year. And that's with losing Fletcher Cox. That's with losing Hassan Reddick. Um, Because I think our defensive line is still good enough. Um, And I think our secondary is a lot better. And it's going to get better in the draft, I think. But also, um, as much trouble as we had at linebacker, and now we got Devin White, and I think Zach Bond is a lot better than people really realize, but he just hasn't had a shot, just didn't get many snaps in with the Saints. But even with our linebacker situation is better than what it was last year. So, um, And even on that front with the linebackers, man, what are you looking at as far as the linebackers? I think they're day two picks. You got Edron Cooper. You got Peyton Wilson. Um, and, of course, everybody in Philadelphia wants Jeremiah Trotter Jr. But I like Peyton Wilson and Edge Cooper – over pretty much everybody else. And I think, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Junior Colson. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, what do you think about the the, the slot at linebacker? Because I think we have, we're going to have uh, our second pick, I believe, is what, 50? And, and it's I somewhere think, around there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that second pick might be the way to go uh, with a linebacker. Yeah, and uh, don't the Eagles have a couple day day two pick? They have more day two picks than well, they have, they have three, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think yeah. yeah. So you're gonna have multiple opportunities to get a linebacker. I think um, this is a good good class to need one in that range, right? There's yeah. no bona fide first round guy, but that's a great. They're they're kind of clustered together. So I think Peyton Wilson is tricky. Uh, because you've got Nicobe Dean, whose you know injuries were a concern coming out, and the, you know it's lingered a little bit for him too. So you wonder about the availability. And I think with Peyton Wilson, um, multiple season-ending injuries in college, and his frame is pretty slight. You know he's around six four in the two thirties, right? But he's very you know if he can stay healthy, he's the clear LB one. I don't think there's any question about that. I think his range is phenomenal. I think his fluidity and coverage, his coverage mm-hmm. instincts and IQ, uh, his ability to flow to the football through congestion is is, is top notch he's like a mosquito he's always around the ball and you don't know how he just is man it's really fun to watch his tape but you wonder about the the injuries and the medicals i think for the eagles in particular that might turn them off from him so that would move you down the board to guys like edger and cooper uh trevin wallace jr colson those are my next few uh cedric gray from north carolina yeah i I guess i think gets overlooked sometimes i don't think he's quite the athlete that jr colson or trevin is but he's still a good athlete and i think you know his ability to splice downhill through zone gapping looks and just you know flow to the football again he's very instinctive working through those levels and getting to the runner and getting him down behind the line of scrimmage and then coverage too 
He gets depth very easily. Uh, he's got great coverage instincts. He can key in on QB intent, you know, reading their eyes. And he can like, make plays on the ball, too. So I think Cedric Gray, if you're looking for a guy in round three, I think he'd be a solid value. I really mm-hmm. like his three-down ability. But the upside with guys like Cooper and Wallace and, and, um, and Colson is really, really appealing, too. So I think it's tough. They're all clustered pretty close together for me. I think I have it Wallace, Cooper, and then uh, or Wallace Colson and then Cooper, I believe. But um, they're all very close for me. They're all kind of in that 70 to 85 range um, where I, th- I do think if you have a late second round pick and you have a big knee at linebacker, it's worth banking on the tools because the tools are very appealing. I think mm-hmm. um, Trevin Wallace, 6'1", 240, 33 inch arms. So he's got really good proportional length and he can use that to engage blocks and the scrum. A uh, very explosive player. He tackles like an apex predator. Um, and he's very good in coverage too. You know, he can erase running backs on wheel routes with the speed. Um, you know, there there are a few times. I think him and Colson have they both have issues in run game diagnosing, but it, it's kind mm. of the opposite. I think with Colson. He can be a little inconsistent, you know, processing gaps, and that can cause hesitation where he freezes a little bit. And then by the time you hesitate a couple milliseconds, you're already a little bit behind and the guard is behind. Exactly. And the guard is working to the second level and he sealed you off. Right. So I think with Colson, I want him to play a little bit more confident at times. I want him to see those things quicker. He's very good in coverage. He's probably one of the best coverage linebackers in this class and the last one. He's really, really nuanced with his coverage technique. Very good at keeping hip leverage. Very good at flowing to the ball. Again, you know, kind of walling off middle field concepts. So he's very good in that phase. It's just the gap reading, right? And things move fast in the NFL. So it's something that he is going to have to work on. I think Wallace has an opposite issue where he's a little over aggressive sometimes. So he'll right. overcommit to the wrong gap early and he'll give wide open cutback lanes to the running back. So, you know, you want those guys to rein those things in. But if you're working with that, right, I think with Vic Fangio, you want linebackers who can provide that blitzing threat too, if you want. Yeah. So I think, you know, those guys are both very explosive, very tenacious. Junior Colson, I think, was playing part of the part of last season with two clubs on his hands right so yeah. you know he i think there was a quote like unless i can't physically move like i'm gonna be on the field so you love that competitive <laughs> toughness uh from your linebackers at the second level i think those guys work well and then edger and cooper again the explosiveness the closing speed downhill uh he's an elite qb spy which is very important and then he's uh-huh. i think his coverage game isn't quite as strong as wallace or colson right now but the upside is there and then he's just a tackle for lost machine he's so good at engaging blocks right. and you know that angle iq coming downhill is very strong with them so all of those guys have kind of their redeeming qualities their concerns but i think in the mid day two range is the perfect spot to take a swing on them yeah and i'm looking at linebackers i'm always looking for two things in linebackers one um i'm always looking at linebacker speed but specifically um most linebackers can run even like use an example of devin white uh mm-hmm. and other linebackers that are fast like that but can they cover? Because running and covering is two different things. Just yeah. because the linebacker can run doesn't mean he can open and close his hips in time to get somebody going on the quick slant across the middle. That makes a big difference. And then also, uh, like you were mentioning, some of those guys, you got to be able to win the battle of physics sometimes because when that pulling guard is coming through or a tackle's coming down and, and going up to the second level to get you, uh, a lot of times the only way you can beat a guy like that that's going to outweigh you 100 pounds is you got to get to the spot first mm-hmm. because I'm a big believer of sometimes you don't, you don't have to make the play to make the play. If you get in there, get in your gap, good technique, you know, feet squared to the line of scrimmage and all of that kind of stuff they teach you at day one, you're going to disrupt the flow of traffic and that running back or that quarterback has got to go in a different direction. And whenever you can make the guy hold the ball too long or you got to make a running back – jump outside the hole or try to bounce it outside that's a win for the defense so i'm always looking for linebackers that can do that um the coverage thing though especially when you're playing with fangio you know he's gonna have the two edges and they're gonna kind of be hybrids Mm -hmm. they're gonna be flip-flopping a little bit so uh the coverage thing has to come into play and i'm always concerned about that because again man even though you can run (laughs) you got to be able to cover because i always look at what uh as an example, what San Francisco was doing when they'll shift Debo to the slot. Now he's over a linebacker, and Debo versus a linebacker is bad for business. So we got to get those linebackers that can move them hips and change directions and things like that, man. So um, I need some guys that can move around. Yeah, and even even beyond that too, you know, 
not flipping your hips too early, right? Because yeah. if, if you get a wide receiver who stems you outside and works inside, right? If, you, if you're if you a little hate too hasty, right? You'll bite, you'll flip your hips outside. And then that transition going back the other way, it's a lot harder to go 180 degrees than 90 degrees, right? right. So it's it's doing the little things to set yourself up to recover quickly as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fun because it, it all goes into creating a complete puzzle. And I think these guys have a lot to like for sure. I think they're very much worth the investment. But there are a few questions, and that's why you don't see them rated higher, like fringe first round guys, right? They have the athletic talent and potential for sure, right? And getting them in the right situation will be key. Devin White, it'll be interesting because he was playing alongside Levante David in Tampa Bay uh, his mm -hmm. whole time there, who David is one of the best linebackers in the modern era. So, yeah. you know, it, it's going to be tough. But I think if you get a rookie who, again, can play coverage, can blitz, I think Vic Fangio can, can do the job of scheming them opportunities early on and making things a little more comfortable for them. Yeah, I think Fangio is going to make our defense. I think by default, Fangio makes our defense average. Yeah, and that's a, that's an improvement from what we had last year. So, uh, very interested to see that. I uh, wanted to hit you with a couple questions from some of my guys in the chat. Uh, my buddy Jason Sink, uh, do you think how he's going to trade up or down? Do you do you think there's a chance he stays at twenty two? I think he'll stay at twenty two, um, unless uh, I know they talked about. Uh, is that what's the kid from Toledo? Is that Kenyon Mitchell? Kenyon Quinyan Mitchell. Yeah. Quinyan Mitchell. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't see him trading up for a DB. When Here's the thing. I, and you guys know you guys know Howie Roseman's tendencies better than I do, but he doesn't usually pick corners round one, right? Nah. That's not usually something he does. Yeah. So but the last the last couple of years he's been breaking tradition. So we didn't maybe, think maybe yeah. We didn't think he was gonna you know get the Georgia collective up here, but he did. Nobody saw that coming. So um, he's been doing things a little bit different. So that's not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. So I think it, it depends on what he really wants in round one, which, you know, we've seen a few. It's not really like teams don't know who they're who they want. Like they don't have they're not centered in on one specific guy right now. Right. You know, it's more kind of a process of elimination. Who would we be OK considering at this point? So I think it depends on how the board falls. Right. I think if there is a situation where Quinion Mitchell, like let's say he really, really likes Quinion, and we don't know this, we're just kind of speculating. Let's say he gets to 18 or 19, right? And mm. you don't, or let's say he gets to 18 and you don't want the Rams or the Steelers to get him. Maybe he makes a slight trade up for that, yeah. right? I think if he really wants a corner, you trade up for that because you've got Quinion Mitchell, who's probably the best scheme fit for you. Terry and Arnold, maybe too. I have him a little bit higher. I think he could go in the top 15. We'll see. Um, it's really a, a toss up with both those guys, but, um, if he really wants a corner, I think you could trade up a little bit. Um, but if he's willing to stamp out and if he wants to upgrade the trenches, which we know traditionally how he does like to use first round picks on the trenches, if he's going to go with a tackle, like we said earlier, I yeah. think you can sit, stay put at 22 because someone is going to be there, whether it's Tyler Guyton, Amarius Mims for the medicals, someone is going to be there, right? Does he trade back? That I'm not super sure. You've already got day two capital, right? So I think yeah. my, I would lean towards staying put or trading up slightly if they really like a guy and he manages to fall a little bit. The only way I can see him trading back is if somebody gives him like, uh, we're at 22. So if somebody says, hey, slide back to 24 or 25 yeah. and we'll give you something in the you know, 160th pick or something goofy yeah. like that. So and, and it's the tackle possible. Class is, it's strong enough in the round one range too, where you could get a yeah. guy like Kingsley Suamataya, right? You could trade back to 28 and get him if you wanted. So there's multiple ways to play it. I think it's situational what ends up happening and how we, if there's one thing he's proven he can be, it's flexible, right? Absolutely. So I think that's, that's the thing to keep an eye out for. Yeah, because he's always trying to stock picks for something else going on that we're not yeah. aware of. And as a draft um, analyst, I'm always team more picks, right? <laughs> so I, I, I love it. I love that strategy. Yeah. Um, let me see what's next. This is somebody from Facebook. I can't see who their name is, but uh, curious about Miami's James Williams at safety, but definitely hybrid linebacker, especially 6'5", 230. Yeah, I think he plays linebacker in the NFL. I do think there are some looks where he can be a strong safety. I think, you know, for his size, it was actually pretty solid at matching uh, mm -hmm. in zone and off man in college. I think, you know, usually with taller guys, there's a point of diminishing returns with their fluidity and their sink. But and he does play a little too tall in coverage. And I think that's something that can be manipulated by NFL wide receivers. But if you want him to man up tight ends in the slot as an off man yeah. defender, I do think he can do that. I think his best role, though, is going to be that weak side linebacker because he's a sledgehammer in support, man. There were multiple times in college where his explosiveness, his size, he would levy devastating hits because he can hit 
guys with a ton of momentum and force. So I think that's where he probably fits best is that strong safety, weak side, linebacker, hybrid. Um, I do think there's enough coverage utility for him to stick in that kind of role, but some um, his main function is going to be support. I like him. He's kind of on the top 100 fringe for me. I still mm-hmm. think there's a few things to clean up, but the upside, I think you need to have a defined role and a plan for him. But if you do have a plan for him, that physical support presence who can engage, who can enforce, who can encumber blocks and make plays at the line of scrimmage, that's the best thing for him. So around the top 100 fringe, late day two, early day three, I'd be sold on that for sure. Now I've heard this kid's name a lot. Um, the kid uh Fountainu. Fatanu. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Fatanu. That's the kid that uh you know Stoutland wants. So whatever Professor Stoutland of Stoutland University wants, uh, we tend to try to get him. But I'm like, we move would we move up for somebody like that, knowing that somebody like Tyler Guyton or some other players could probably fall our way at 22. So I'm not sure. Yeah, it depends on how you feel about him potentially switching to right tackle. Because Troy Fatanu played le- he played guard for yeah. a, a stretch in his college career, and he played left tackle in 2023. I, I, to my to my knowledge, I'll have to look back. I know he doesn't have extensive experience at right tackle, right. so you would be you it would be a move for him. That said, whenever I I'm projecting guys to right tackle that haven't played a ton of it, right? There are a few traits that I look for: athleticism, coordination, balance, you know, and nuance, right? Because you're going to have to mirror everything that you do on the left side to the right side. So you want to you don't want to be working from the ground floor. You want to have some semblance of a functional floor, you know, operationally, and then also the athleticism, the recovery components that can help make that job easier. And Troy Fatanu has every single one of those. So I think it's one of those things that could make that transition easier. Um, he's my OT4. He's the top Top 15 prospect for me so big fan of what he has to offer with the athleticism the uh you know 6'4 320 but 34 and a half inch arms so he's got really good proportional length so you know what that does for you that natural leverage allows you to play with better pad level and he's got great knee bend too so lurching mm-hmm. isn't an issue but even more than that he has the link to get inside your frame right so you know it's it's a really good hands on you man it's a wrap exactly exactly and then when when you know when you do get outside him he's got insane recovery capacity we've seen it with the spins and the kick steps out you know he's a really impressive player for sure and i think for the eagles if you if you're confident that you can move him to the right side or if you want to play him a guard in the immediate timeline right i think there's a lot of flexibility that comes with that kind of profile yeah and and i mean once statland gets a hold of you every offensive lineman we've gotten has gotten better because of statland so uh, I remember hearing him when uh, I was one of the people that uh, that wanted to get Cliff Kingsbury uh, as our offensive coordinator. And then, you know, after we hired Kellen Moore, I heard that Kingsbury wanted to bring in his own staff. Rightfully so. But I'm like, if that means getting rid of Jeff Stoutland, hell to the no. Mm-hmm. Like, he ain't going nowhere. So um, he's one of those Teflon Dons that we got here. Uh, he's the best in the business. So uh, that that shouldn't be changing anything. And it's really real quick, too. It's really interesting, the dynamics of picking Fatanu versus picking Guyton, right? Because if you're picking Fatanu, he doesn't need time behind the scenes. I think you can play him at guard right away if you want to right. get him on the field as soon as possible. Whereas with Guyton, that's more a future minded pick where you're probably putting him behind Lane Johnson at right yep. tackle, letting him learn behind the scenes. And then eventually when Lane Johnson moves on, you can have a succession plan of play. So there's multiple dynamics to each different prospect. And uh, it's ultimately up to the Eagles what balance they want. Right. I want to I want to go back a couple years. Do you remember what your what your grades were for Cam Jurgens? Because the one thing I'm seeing right now is, you know, you watching the national media and everybody's like, what are the Eagles going to do on the offensive line now that Jason Kelsey's gone? And I'm like, y'all must not have been paying attention. Yeah. Cam Jurgens was ready to start last year. Um, I think Cam Jurgens is legit. Uh, what was your what was your um, outlook on him when he came out? No, that was actually my thought process because, um, you know, I, I write trending pieces for PFN sometimes when news does occur. Like, you know, hey, Ian, what are your thoughts on this? Right. So um, naturally, people were searching, you know, center options for the Eagles in the draft. Right. Because Jason yeah. Kelsey is retired. Who do we pick at center? And I'm over here writing this piece. And I'm like, did Cam Jurgens 
disappear? Like, what are we doing here? Like, we, he played center in Nebraska. He was a very good center in Nebraska. He was actually, I thought the Eagles was the perfect fit for him. So I was really mm-hmm. excited that he he got there because you think about outside zone, inside zone, getting up field, right? The range and space, the physicality, well leveraged. Again, I think Jason Kelsey was the perfect player to learn from because physically those profiles are pretty similar. So, you know, I was writing that piece, center options in the draft for the Eagles. And I literally put a preface at the top of the piece, like, Hey, the Eagles' best option is in-house. It's Cam Jurgens. Just Absolutely. move him, move him back to center, where his most natural position, right, and get someone else to guard. I know they have Tyler Steen potentially could play guard. Um, I think he had upside there for sure. So I'm hoping they see that through. But they could also pick a guy early in the in the draft as well. So it's going to be interesting. But no, my evaluation on Cam Jurgens was. I think I had a top 100 grade on him, and I think the perfect situation was learning for a couple of years, you know, and and mm-hmm. that's what he got to do. And now I think he's in a scheme that's perfectly attuned to his skill set, and he's got some experience under his belt. I think he's ready to run with it. So yeah, I stick with him at center and, and forget about it. Uh, bumping back up to the cornerbacks and DBs, uh, my buddy John Malmos on Facebook wants to know uh, what are your thoughts on Kamari Lasseter. Yeah, he's a solid player for sure. You know, he's, I think, a top 75 guy for me. Round two would be a little rich at this point, but I think Mm -hmm. a guy who's physical, one of the best support corners in the class, right? So if you want a guy who can flow downhill, uh, just surge and, 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 you know, explode past blocks, really relentless. You know, he doesn't let anything back, doesn't hesitate at all. You know, when he sees a screen, he's clicking and closing and he's making that tackle. That's one thing I love about Kamari Kamari Laster. Um, His functional athleticism, isn't quite elite and that's going to be the big hang up especially the vertical speed there are times when he does give up separation i think he plays a little faster than his 40 yard dash time so i'm it's not as as huge of a concern for me i remember when they played missouri and he went up against luther burton who's probably going to be the top receiver or one of the top receivers for the next class right but he's got vertical speed and lassiter stuck to his hip pocket pretty well so i think kamari lassiter plays faster than that 40 time, but not elite explosiveness and speed, right? So there are times where guys need to step on him, but his agility, his fluidity, his change of direction is really impressive. He's physical. Um, he can play press man, but he can also play in zone and side saddle, and he's got great ball tracking abilities. So I think a, you know, a, a slightly lower ceiling because you don't have that elite vertical speed or burst, but a really solid you know, two-phase player with coverage variability, elite support chops, and some playmaking mm-hmm. potential too. So I think, you know, late round two, early round three, I'd be all over that. Nice. Uh, we got a lot of people. Let me see. Right now we are kicking 224 people, but everybody, everybody's on Twitter. They got me on Twitter live. So if you are on in the Twitter space, do me a solid. Um, switch on over to YouTube and join me here on YouTube and Make sure you smash that like and subscribe button so we can keep this thing moving. Got a good group tonight, man. The chat is on fire, bro. Chat's on Um, fire. Hey, it's draft season. It's the perfect time for it. Dude, it's about to get nuts. Do you think, um, because I'm always, uh, or the the, the big thing right now is uh, Devontae Smith and getting his deal done. And I'm wondering if they're going to, I think what they're waiting on, and if, heck, if Devontae Smith has has any representation worth their salt, they're waiting to see what Justin Jefferson's going to do because he's going to set the bar um, because he's about to get paid one way or Mm -hmm. the other. So uh, I think they're trying to wait that out. And also I'm hoping, I'm really, really hoping that the Eagles will get this done before the draft, because that way they'll know how much money they get. They're dealing with and all of that kind of stuff. And not for nothing next year, probably the salary cap's going to go up again. Because it went up to what two fifty this year, two fifty five or something like that. I believe so. It goes up every year. It's it's by yeah. varying amounts, but it, it always climbs a little bit. And then so next year it's projected to be between two seventy and two eighty. So that's a little bit more monopoly money to play with. But um, heck, uh, helps us out. Yeah, for sure, helps us out. And you know, um, uh, what's the name? Rosenthal just left, man. So you know, if you want to come down to Philly and work for Howie as the new capologist. You know, we need some help there, man. I don't have the cap insight, man. I, I, I just look at the cap tables and I just go from there. I try to keep up with it just for the mock drafts, you know, because I wrote yeah. I wrote a seven rounder every month this cycle. So, you know, you want to have an idea, not just of the team's roster, but also the expiring contracts and year over mm-hmm. years. Right. So I, I had I maintained an awareness of it, but that's it. I can't I can't if you ask me to put a bunch of void years in the contract to make it, you know, nullifiable or whatever the whatever black magic the saints do down there you know every year to kind of make their make their um cap roll over work i can't do that i can't do that but i can i can look at it that's all i can do 
Yeah, we'll see. Somebody's talking about uh, Justin Jefferson is trying to get Cincinnati to reunite with Chase and Burrow. So possibly uh, Cincinnati is my hometown, born and raised. Uh, we'll see if Cincinnati want to pony up that type of money. Um, but hey, everybody's throwing it around, so we shall see. Um, who was that? Uh, get my second monitor going. Oh, uh, another name I've been hearing about, Max Melton. Yeah. What are your yeah, What are your thoughts on him, man? He's a good player. He's a good player. He's in my top fifty for sure. Okay. Um, slot boundary versatility. He's explosive. Vertical speed. Really, um, the physical profile is impressive with him because he's 5'11", but he's got 32-inch arms. So he's fluid, oh, nice. really good swivel freedom, but he can get inside your frame and he can disrupt and press man. Um, he's got good zone route recognition as well. He can cl click and close and hawk in front of passes, and he's got the speed to house plays too. So uh, okay. really, really solid physical profile, a lot of upside. The discipline can improve in zone. You know, there is some overaggression yeah. at times. I think his technique and press man can be a little more efficient, but um, nothing that would make it a liability for me. I My comp for him is Robert Alford, um, mm -hmm. who, if you remember, he played for the Falcons, the Cardinals a little bit, but he was a playmaker, man. He was a really productive on the ball um, and pretty solid in support, too. I think Max Mellon has that kind of versatility where you can play the boundary, you can play the slot, whatever you need him to. He could stand to pack a little more mass on his frame, but all the tools are there for him to be an impact starter, I think. So I think what's he's he, my – What's he weighing? He weighed in, I want to say, 186. So uh. a little bit lighter. Yeah, I know. But, you know, I, I think he can pack on a little bit. I think he's got a little bit of room. But yeah. um, a little bit leaner prospect just by default, right? So it, it's a little tough. But I think his length allows him to counteract that and support, engage blocks a little bit, keep himself clean, which you'd like to see. So right. he's my CB – Five or six, he's in that forty range, so he's he's a good player for sure. Yeah, man, I'm gun shy, man. I'm, I am really because of what happened last year with our injuries, man. I'm really looking at the size of these DBs. Yeah, um, and I get that. Yeah, there's usually a correlation. You know, it's not it's not like some guys are like Teflon, like they can they can just you know bounce off of Devonte Smith for the wide receiver position, yeah. for example, right? Yeah. But um, it's not the same for every guy, and usually there is you know a slight correlation. So I get it. And, yeah, and you're gonna get guys like that because I mean I played with with um with Mark McMillan, one of the smallest DBs in the league at the time. Yeah. Uh, Mini Mac. So uh. If you got the heart and you got the technique, you can get it done, man. But I just think it's such a physical game um, right now, and you got to be able to come up and make a tackle. Uh, you can't be making business decisions out there because that's how we're going to get burned, man. And and um, just looking at last year, like looking at somebody like um, what happened with with James Bradbury, we got to get his replacement. I don't. I'm not sure. Um, that's what I kind of think in the back of my mind. My head is telling me that how he's going to try to get some picks together and, and get a package for James Bradbury and a couple of picks to send him somewhere, or he'll be one of the most expensive backups that we have. Cause there's no way he can start next year. And mm -hmm. I am looking at um, some of these young guys we got to get in here because Bradbury just looked bad at the end of the year. Like he I always, I make a joke. Like he looked like he was running an oatmeal. Mm -hmm. Like his turnover just wasn't, wasn't there no more. He wasn't moving his hips. And he was just getting, especially that Seattle game, he was just getting burned all over the field. The last six passes were all on him, and that's how they beat us. So I'm always looking at somebody like, because I'm like, if we get Cooper DeJean, put him over there where where Bradbury is and, you know, let that man teach him how to watch film or something like that because we got to get somebody better in there, man. But it looks like we've got um, a plethora of good cornerbacks, good linebackers, uh, that are ready to rock and roll this year in the draft. Um, one receiver I wanted to ask you about, and that's the tall dude uh, from Florida State, uh, Keon Coleman. I was going to say tall dude from Florida State. You got to be more specific. <laughs> There's two of them, uh, Keon Coleman, Johnny Wilson. But yeah, Keon um, is a fun player. He's, I think, my wide receiver eight right now. Okay. So he's still a top 50 player for me. I know he's been falling a little bit, but um. I really like I really like what he has to offer. I think, especially with the Eagles, right? You've got Devontae Smith on one end, who's mm. that separator. He's got enough vertical speed, right? But he, he's got a full route tree. And then you've got A.J. Brown, who's another vertical threat, but he can win with play strength, right? But he can man the other boundary. I think Keon Coleman could be a really nice movement Z between them, where you can play the boundary or you can scheme him rack touches in the slot because he's explosive. He's got great contact balance, great agility. 
Um, very good weapon with the ball in his hands. I, the explosion, the vertical, not he doesn't have elite vertical speed, but I think his play pace, his play urgency is really impressive to me. You know, so he's a great rack threat and alpha in, at the catch point, which showed up with his TD percentage. You know, you see, you know, sometimes, you know, they kind of relied on that to a fault. Sometimes putting him in those 50 50 situations where naturally your game is going to be more volatile, but he's so good at winning positioning early in reps. He can box out guys. He has, he has a basketball background, so it shows up with his positioning, his leverage awareness as a receiver. Um, and he's very authoritative when it comes to snaring the ball past his frame. He doesn't let it into his frame very often. He can catch it with diamond technique and it's right. over. You know, it's secured from that point on. So I really like the rack ability. I really like the alpha mentality at the catch point. And I do think there's route running upside. I think he can stand to expand his route tree a little more, but he can separate on quick slants and, and little and short digs with his short area agility and his quickness. And there are really bl- bright flashes of you know, leverage awareness and targeted physicality at second level intermediate route stems, you know, where he's, you know, offsetting a DB with a quick jab step and then using a swim move to get outside on those corner Mm. routes. You know, there's a, there's a lot of promise on tape with that. So I think with Keon Coleman, if you have a plan for him right away, you know, you can scheme him touches as as that rack threat and let him get a rhythm while he's developing his game. I really like the kind of upside that's there with him. So a good wide receiver, two, three, weapon for the eagles and i think um if the if he's there that's that's the key part right if he's there in the mid round too we don't really know uh receivers can fall dk metcalf for example um and especially in this wide receiver class with the amount of talent up top it feels like someone is gonna fall we just don't know who but keon with the 40 time as a candidate i think he'd be a phenomenal uh pick for the eagles now uh is um is brock bowers all of that is he is he that good i think he is yeah Yeah. i think he is it's um you know i like to it's it's difficult because every time you see the tight end label you know people talk about positional value i don't think he's just a tight end i think he's a weapon pretty much right you scheme touches however you can you know sweeps jet motions you know behind the line of scrimmage or drag routes seam routes and he's got a good route tree in the middle of the field you know digs and slants and things like that um, but yeah, he's just, I think the complete three level framework is there with him. I mean, first off size, speed, athleticism at around six, three, two forty four. Mm-hmm. he's got legit four five pace when he's on the vertical plane where he can generate separation, he can stack. And then if he gets the ball, you know, he's like a ball of butcher knives out in space. Like it's really tough to slow this guy with a solo tackler. His legs are always churning. He can bounce off solo tackle attempts with that frame density. I um, mean, his physicality too. And at the catch point as well, he can extend beyond his frame and make some really, really high difficulty adjustments and still come down with the football. So really explosive weapon who you can just get the ball and let him work. Um, I do think that there is a little bit of stiffness in his hips as a route runner, mm-hmm. which does show up at times. So I think the route tree can still stand to improve a little bit. But if you have a vision for this guy as a weapon, yes, I do think he's all that because he's an immediate size speed mismatch wherever you line him up against the DB, right? He can mm-hmm. outmatch them with the size and contested situations, or it's just tough to slow him down when he has the ball in his hands. So a lot to like. He's a top 10 player for me. And I think, you know, in the right scheme can definitely be a player. I, I haven't seen I haven't seen a tight end get this much hype, in my opinion, yeah. since since like Jeremy Shockey. Yeah, and it's dangerous too, right? Because the hype can be kind of deafening and it kind yeah. of sometimes it can prevent you from looking at a player objectively, right? So you always want to make sure you do that. But looking at Brock Bowers, I, I do think it's there. I mean, from day one at Georgia, he was productive and it wasn't a fluke. This guy was making right. plays left and right, every phase possible. Um, the injury was a minor concern this past year, had tight rope surgery on the ankle. But um, you know, by and large, I think you're looking at a guy who's gonna be hundred percent and has a lot to offer in every single phase. I think the favorite parts for me are the rack ability and the contested mm-hmm. catch ability, but he does have the foot speed and the agility and the, the angle freedom on his brakes to be a really good route runner too. And he's a solid move blocker. There's that's the other the other weakness with him is that he's you know average size for a tight end. So naturally, as an inline blocker, you don't have quite as much play strength as you would with another guy. So I think right. if you want him, want to use him as a blocker use him as an H back or a guy in the slot out wide in space on a on lead on wide zone runs. Right. But I do think generally you can scheme him wherever he's just a weapon. That's kind of been my, my go-to definition for him. You know, he's a weapon. Let him, let him loose. Uh, and sticking with the tight ends, I'm going to go back a couple years on you. Cause I just want to know this now. Yeah. Um, what, what were your thoughts on Albert? O? we got him from Denver. 
Yeah. And I'm like, this kid is too big, too fast, and too athletic to not be getting any, any playing time. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Why did why did Denver let him go? And I've seen a little bit of footage on him, and I'm like, that's somebody you got to get the ball. You got to get the ball to. Dallas Goddard is going to be there and have a two tight end system the way uh, Keller Moore might want to run. Plus, we just got um, – what's the guy that played with the Jets in Cincinnati? CJ. Yeah, CJ Uzama. Yeah, so uh, we got a we got a nice roster of tight ends right now, man. Yeah, for sure. Albert O, he I think he came out in the draft. Was he the same year as Drew Locke? Because I know Drew Locke threw to him in college. I don't remember if it was the same year. but um, That was a little before my time as a comprehensive draft analyst. I liked mm-hmm. to think I knew about the draft back then. <laughs> I didn't. I was really bad at it. So um, I, I'll defer. I'll defer on that one. But yeah, from what right. I do know about him, the size, speed, athleticism, I think is really appealing. If I remember correctly, six foot seven or something ran really yeah, fast huge, in the man. 40. Yeah. So I think you've got a lot of raw tools there. And I think the, the off season is a great, is a great opportunity to fill out that 90 man roster with guys like that who could take advantage of that opportunity if they put the work in. Right. So you always want to take swings on those guys if they're available. So it's going to be intriguing to see, but they got Goddard, they got Uzama. So I think you're filling out the tight end room in the right way. You're getting depth, you're getting versatility, and you're letting them play it out in camp and see what happens. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I'm going to get uh, one more question in. I'm going to let you out of here. Um, and then we are going to do a little bit of mock drafting, see what see where we end up. I've done like three of them today. Um, but uh, my buddy 88's MC, uh, what's your thoughts on safety Taylor Demerson from Texas Tech oh, that's and Kalen King from Penn State? Yeah, Taylor Demerson's my guy. Real quick, mock drafts. I think I d- I've done like 20, 20,000 the past month, man. It's, it's bad. It's bad. You need a break from that when it's, when it's all said and done. But Taylor Demerson, man, he is my guy. I'm a big fan of what he has to offer. I, I've been working on NFL comps the past couple of weeks um, yeah. for, for a graphic campaign that we're doing, you know, and I always try to think about a comp. Like I, I don't just kind of throw a name out there. You know, I want to watch a little bit of a historical player and their play style and the frame dimensions, right? I try to align it up as best as I can. And also, you know, ideal outcomes. Like if, if this player is what I think he can be, what kind of player can he be repetition wise, right. right? So, you know, I try to align in a lot of different ways. And a comp that popped out for me with Taylor Demerson was um, Antoine Bethea. He played with the mm-hmm. Colts. He was a yeah. very good player. Um, he could play too high. He could play single high. He could man up in the slot if you wanted him to. Really fleet-footed mover. Um, but generally, you're going to see him in too high and single high. And he can play downhill in support, too. He's very physical. I got to speak with him a little bit at the NFL Combine. And he's he takes pride in that ability to, you know, just kind of be a passionate leader for the defense. You know, kind of tone mm-hmm. setter whose mentality permeates the rest of the roster. So, He's a leader. You know, all of his teammates kind of are gravitate to him. And then you see his versatility, his playmaking ability, his range, you know, his ball skills at the point of attack. Um, just a really solid player, man. I mean, I, I feel like I'm writing a love letter, but he's the top 50 guy for me. <laughs> I, I know he's a little bit lower for some other people, but Taylor Demerson is the top 50 player for me. I think he can play the nickel spot. The big question is where does he line up, safety or nickel? I think he can play nickel and off man. But his press man nickel chops aren't quite as good for me. There are times where he gets a little too upright. His footwork can be a little uncoordinated. So I would prefer him in off man and zone where he can pedal more and, and right. work with that pedal because he's more comfortable there. But too high, single high, um, perfect fit for him. Hmm. And then uh, Kalen King, I think, was the second one. Yeah, he's a he's a early to mid to late. You know, anywhere on day three, I'd be comfortable with that. I think this year definitely has stopped stock dipped a lot i mean we were talking about some big grades in the summer and then it really kind of leveled out for him i think he might translate better at safety i think that Mm -hmm. can mitigate some of the athleticism concerns while also allowing him to rely on that route recognition and the playmaking ability that he does have and the physicality right i think the biggest thing for him is that when you're impressed man and you make a misstep right you don't even have to make a misstep right but if a wide receiver can offset you enough where they have a path up field if you don't have elite vertical athleticism that's going to be a problem for you. And we saw that against Marvin Harrison Jr. We saw that against other guys too. Kalen King just doesn't quite have the burst and recovery speed to make up for those mishaps, right? So I think getting him in space where he can be fluid, where he can read and react, where he can make plays on the ball and where he can, you know, work downhill with his physicality, I think that's the way to go. I think early to mid day three would be a solid fit for him. And the experience at corner will bode well for him. I think right away can be a solid rotational guy for you off man zone schemes. But, you know, there is some limited upside because the vertical athleticism, the speed, 
isn't at that elite level. It's closer to average for you. So I think if it gets late enough, a very solid dart swing. But I think there's a lot of other defensive backs in this class too. The corner class is very deep, and I think that's a good thing. But it also kind of, you know, creates a predicament for you where you kind of have to choose, all right, who are we going to invest in? That's the key thing. Gotcha. All right, last question, man. Um, Who's your dark horse? Who's the guy that nobody's talking about? The guy that nobody's talking about. Oof. That's a tough one, man. Who's the guy that you've been watching film on and you're like, this guy should be getting a little bit more pub? Well, I, there, there's there's one, uh, Quantez Stiggers from Toronto, the, <laughs> the CFL guy. I watched a little <laughs> I, I watched a little I, I know it's kind of a cop out because he's been kind of that redemptive story. And I'll I'll try and I'll try and think of another one while I'm talking about him. I'm no, I got a I got a one of my homeboys is uh Milt Stiegel. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, Milt Milt Stiegel. We kind of all Milt was like I think a year, but he's he's a Cincinnati boy. We were we were all friends growing up in high school. Yeah, that's cool. So. That's cool. But yeah, Quantez is a, a fun player, man. I, I was watching some of his CFL stuff today, and uh, he was basically winning off of athleticism and talent. And you know, you can tell he's got the smarts. Like he can click yeah. and close. He can recognize routes, and he's very good in zone pedaling and, and managing overlapping route concepts. Like if he's pedaling off man on a vertical nine route and he's got an outbreaker coming downhill and the QB is already triggering on that outbreaker, he can see that in an instant and he can tr- click and close and he can make a play mm-hmm. on the ball. Uh, so I think the processing ability, I think the athleticism is all there. And you're wondering about, you want the Eagles to get strong corners, right? With a little yeah. more frame density. He's around six foot 204. So he's got that lean mass and he's got that play strength. I think his support technique like and tackling ability can still improve, but I think you're getting a ton of playmaking ability with this guy. So he graded out as an early day three guy for me. I would be okay with taking a swing on him in that range if you want. I think the talent is there. And as I was talking about him, I just remembered the running back class. Uh, a couple guys, FCS running backs that I, I don't think get nearly enough pub. Dylan Lobby from New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. is a very fun player he's an elite receiving back but i also think at 510 208 is really dense compact yeah. and really explosive and he knows right. how to yeah and he knows how to stem guys as a runner too you know he can press behind blocks and bait dbs in the over setting and then capitalize so i think he's going to be a really good player and then isaiah davis from south dakota state he doesn't have that elite vertical speed but six foot 220 and you know for that size like he's a powerful back like he's a finisher he's physical mm-hmm. But he's so good at using footwork to create behind the line of scrimmage. I really like his creative instincts and his vision. He's going to be a very good back for a long time, I think. Th- those guys don't get enough pub in this running back class. And I think if you can get him on day three, um, you're getting a very solid player and a really good return on your investment. Sounds good, bro. Um, do me a favor and try to get you some sleep because uh, it's only going to get worse in the yeah. next two weeks, bro. <laughs> I'll try to. I'll try to, man. It's a, it's a it's an ongoing struggle, but I appreciate it. I, pre- I appreciate the chance to talk draft, talk Eagles. It was a fun time. Absolutely, man. Uh, we will connect again, man, but I appreciate your time, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a good one. Talk to you later. And there we have it, folks. Ian Cummings, I t- hey, I tried to tell you. I tried to told you. Uh, the dude knows his stuff. He watches a ton of film. And you know, he tried to defer it, but I put him up just like Greg Cosell, just like Baldy, uh, Barrett, all those guys that watch film. I'm telling you, man, he does his homework. So check him out at PFN. Check him out on Twitter. I see underscore Cummings. No, I see underscore draft. That's his Twitter handle. So um, check out his stuff, man. He's always got good stuff. He's been putting out a lot of content for pro foot, pro football network dot com um and when you guys you know when we do our mock drafts um that's the that's the channel i use pro football network with their with their draft simulator so uh he's putting out a lot of good content man he's a really good dude uh appreciate him taking heck almost an hour with me man online so that was good stuff i tried to tell you hope y'all was taking notes man i'm sure there's some i'm sure there's some betting feature that you could do um putting it in parlays and all of that kind of stuff that i don't have no idea about where you can make bets on who's going to get drafted man he's the guy to talk to man so but i'm i'm really um i want to see the eagles get cooper DeGene. i don't think we have to move up too off too much to get him i don't think we have to move anywhere to get him i think we can stand pat uh and he'll fall right to us man the draft order is still stacked um, I don't think that's going to change unless somebody just 
does something stupid in the first 10 picks. The only thing I can see is like if Washington doesn't take Jaden Daniels and they take, um, I don't know, somebody else, Roma Dunze or something like that, or maybe Washington and Denver swaps. And well, no, Denver got a trade, so I don't think that's that's the right one. I think that's the order with Denver at five. But the number five pick, uh, are they going to take another quarterback? Is somebody going to move up? Um, who knows what's going to happen, man? Who knows what's going to happen? But I think we're in good shape to get the player that we want. It's all about trying to figure out what Howie Roseman wants to do. Um, I want Cooper DeGene, but history would remind me that Howie's probably going to take that offensive tackle, uh, Tyler Guyton, or maybe he will move up to get that kid, uh, uh, Fontenot. Um, who knows, man? Who knows? That's the fun of the draft. So you never know what's going to happen, dude. You never know what's going to happen, man. I meant to ask about Chop Robinson, but I don't think we're going to end up with Chop Robinson anyways. Um, some of the mocks I'm looking at's got Chop Robinson going to Detroit. Um, put him on the other side of Adrian Hutchinson, man. That's a good, that's a good deal to to have on your defense, man. So it's been pretty good, man. It's been pretty good. Thanks, Jason, man. Uh, we had fun with that, man. I've uh, been talking with Ian, <laughs> and I appreciate the fact that him being on time right off the bat, so we can get right into it, man. Um, let me see. I am looking to set up. Something that was going goofy with my OBS when I logged in. Um, so I can't bring you into my screen, but I can restart my mock draft like I did before. So let's go back to the simulator and let's go 22. And I just have to talk you talk you through it. I'm only going to do the I'll do the five rounds. What do we got here? I don't know. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Oh, there we go. There we go. Sorry. Uh Uh-oh. I think everything's just locked up on me. There we go. Network, Smart Draft Simulator. There we go. Now we acting right. Now we acting right. Ah, uh, man, I hope y'all was taking notes. Hope y'all was taking notes. All right, so now we are back in the mock draft, and we are at pick 22 for the Philadelphia Eagles, and the first thing that pops up is Minnesota wants to do a trade. Now, if I'm Howie, I would do this trade, right? Because Minnesota wants to give us, we are at 22. Minnesota wants to give us the 23rd pick, so we're only swapping picks. We're only dropping back one spot. And he wants to give us pick 108, and they want to give us pick 157. So I'm going to take that trade. I'm going to accept that trade. And who did who did they get? They picked Johnny Newton, defensive tackle out of Illinois. They moved up to get Johnny Newton. So we're still at 23. And you got Byron Murphy. Uh, you got Tyler Guyton is still available. The best offensive lineman available. And uh, let's see. Cooper DeGene is gone. Let me see. Who got Cooper DeGene? Troy Fountain. Uh, Fountain News going to the going to the Steelers. Jared Verse goes to ooh, Detroit. Detroit, man, killing them with the edges, man. Kenyon Mitchell goes to Jacksonville. He must have went early. Hold on. Dallas, Joe, Kenyon Mitchell. No, I don't see him off the board. What just happened? Hold on. Defense. Let's go defense. And cornerback. Say, oh, they got him listed as safety, not cornerback. Okay. So Cooper DeGene is still available. So I'm going to go with Cooper DeGene at 23 because that's the guy that I want. So I'm doing that. And then we go all the way down, I think, 50. So now we got 50. So we got another pick, and they want to drop us down to 72. Um, yeah, Bob, I got DeGene. I want DeGene. If, we, if DeGene is available, that's who I'm going for, man. That's the guy that I want. So now we are at pick number 50. Um, and if you're looking at everybody, uh, 
The top player on the board still is Michael Penix Jr., quarterback from Washington. You got Troy Franklin, a wide receiver from Oregon. Uh, Ruke Ohoro from Clemson, the defensive tackle. Cooper BB, offensive guard. Um, let's see if we can get a. Let's see if we can get a tackle. Let's see a good off. Rosengarten, he's still available. Um, I'm gonna go Rosengarten. Six five three zero eight. Tackle for Washington. Now we drop back two. We still we at fifty three. So we we picking again. Oh shoot! Dang it! I, put, I hit the wrong button. Somebody offered a trade and I accepted it, and I didn't mean to do that. So now I dropped us back to sixty four. My bad. Bad job by me. So now we dropped to sixty four and got an extra pick. But uh, okay, so now we're at sixty four. So let's get uh, Christian Hayes, Wilson. Um, linebackers uh i probably would have got uh peyton wilson but because i screwed up the draft but we still got cedric gray that's the guy that um that's the guy that ian was talking about from north carolina so i am gonna we still got colson junior colson is still available too 238 cedric gray i'm gonna go cedric gray from north carolina so we still get a good linebacker uh, and now we are at round three on day two, round four. So now we're at day three. Um, did somebody ask earlier about about James Williams, linebacker out of Miami? Or am I thinking of somebody else? I can't remember. Um, okay. So let right now. So, so far, 23, we got Cooper DeGene. At 50, we got Roger Rosengarten. 64, we got Cedric Gray. And we are at the 108th pick. And I'm going to look for... Looking at an offensive guard, actually. Mason McCormick from South Dakota State. Zach Zenter. I know somebody in the chat mentioned Zach Zenter. The offensive guard from Michigan. Um, Brandon Coleman from TCU is still... Uh, tops in the draft, six four three thirteen guard. Um, let me see. And maybe what are our, what do our edges look like? Now would be the time to get a defensive tackle or an edge. Jalex Hunt. Somebody else mentioned it late. Jalex Hunt. Um, wide receivers. I can look at wide receivers. What we got? Jermaine Burton from Alabama. Another Alabama boy. Malik Washington. Um, Jamari Thrash. From Louisville. Brendan Rice, Taj Washington, Cornelius Johnson, um, Zenter. Bob Bob Brown is saying we need to get a wide receiver. What about a D tackle or offensive guard? Which what are you guys thinking? Kamara Edge from Colorado State. Uh, let me see. Shipley you got running backs, linebackers. Josh Newton's available. Jackson McKinley. Uh, did the Burton has great skills? Jermaine Burton. I like his size. Jermaine Burton, six foot one ninety six. I can live with that. Like I'm not big. If you were a small receiver, I'm looking at the. Uh, I'm looking for for like you got to be a burner. Uh, who are the G's? The guards. You got Brandon Coleman from TCU, Mason McCormick, Layden Robinson, and Zach Zenter. Zach Zenter is ranked 147 uh, on this draft board. Brandon Coleman is ranked 121. So the best, the best guard available is Brandon Coleman. Uh, I think, don't we, we got a tackle. We already got a tackle. We got Roger Rosengarten. So we already got a tackle. Um Trying to think, do I want to get a guard? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get. Um, they're basically the same size. Brandon Coleman and Mason McCormick are both the same size, and I can't really. There's not really a a draft report on Mason McCormick, so I'm just gonna pick the best guard available at this point, which is uh, Brandon Coleman. 
and then we wait a little bit. Thank you, Bob. I grabbed that. And we should be up again at 120th pick. Now I will look at a wide receiver, and I am going to grab. Nah, he's too small. I don't want to. Look at Wilson. What's his first name? He might be already gone. Oh, Luke McCaffrey is available at 155 from Rice. What do you guys think about that? Here, here are the best wide receivers available. You got Malik Washington, Jamari Thrash, Brendan Rice, Javon Baker, Luke McCaffrey, Taj Washington, Jalen Coker, Jaquan Jackson, Cornelius Johnson, Jordan Whittington. Uh, I don't, uh, I know, but I don't, I think they're going to get a, they're going to get an undrafted free agent at running back. I don't think they're going to drive. I don't think we need a draft. Brendan Rice. I like his size. Six, two, um, Jamari thrash. Malik Washington is, is too small for me. I need somebody. I'm going to go. I like that size. I'm going to go Brendan Rice. I like that, Bob. Brennan Rice it is. If you guys are on Twitter, please, please do me a favor. Look me up on YouTube and make sure you subscribe. We got we got over 279 people in Twitter right now. 280 people on in the Twitter space right now. So what I need is at least 200 of those people in Twitter. If you're listening to Twitter, jump on over to YouTube and hit that subscribe button. I appreciate you. Uh, we're going to reject and so we are at in the draft we are at 157 and as the jeans rice is probably a better pick yep i picked rice on this one all right so now i think so here's what we're looking at right now we got cooper de jean raza rosengarten uh cedric gray brandon coleman brendan rice and now we're at pick 157 i am going to go defensive tackle and I'm going to get um, Justin Justin Eboyji from Alabama, six foot four, two ninety seven. So we're going to pick up a guy from Bama, and let me see. Do we have another one? We are at pick one sixty one, and now I'm going to get an edge. And I've got this guy in about three drafts so far. I'm going to pick up Cedric Johnson. From Ole Miss. And who's the other guy? Oh, Brennan Jackson from Washington State. I've had him in two. Uh, I've had him in two mock, mock drafts. 6'3", 264. But I'm going to get Cedric Johnson. And I think that's it. Oh, we got the, the trade picks. I'm going to skip the rest of it. So... That's pretty good. Look at Eric Watts from UConn. What position? What position, Bob? Let me see Watts. Eric Watts, Edge from UConn. He is available. And I will take him. I will take your word for it and pick him up as our 171st pick. And we still got 172 and 210. So, okay, okay, okay. Um. And you know what? I'm just going to pick the best available right now. And we got Aaron Casey, linebacker from Indiana. And last but not least, um, I will go ahead and get a running back. He will be our, at 210, he will be our uh, Mr. Irrelevant. <laughs> George Halani from Boise State. Carson Steele from UCLA. Kimani Vidal, Dejan Edwards, and Imani Bailey. Um, 510, 208. That's a good size. Carson Steele from UCLA, six foot, 228. I'm going to take the kid out of UCLA because I like his size because eventually we're going to have to pass block. So, um, Joe Milton. Why would I draft Joe Milton? Dylan Johnson from, from Washington. 
217. Yeah, I like the other guy's size better. Carson Steele. We'll go with the kid from USC. All right, we're done. Not bad. Not bad. We got Cooper DeJean. Cooper DeJean, Roger Rosengarten, Cedric Gray, Brandon Coleman. We got eight. We made 10 picks in this draft, and there is no way that Howie's going to make that many damn picks in this draft. That ain't happening. <laughs> so let's uh, restart. Let's see if I can not make mistakes this time. And who we got? Okay, so I'm rejecting that first. I'm going to take the 22nd spot. I'm going to keep that. Um, Caleb Williams, the first six or seven picks are not changing. Although, well, let me take that back because now this one, Caleb Williams has been the universal number one pick. Now, Washington, instead of taking Jaden Daniels, they are taking Drake May. The Patriots take Jaden Daniels. Malik Neighbors goes to Arizona. Marvin Harrison Jr. goes to the Bolts. J.J. McCarthy goes to Minnesota. Joe Alt goes to Tennessee. Uh, Fashanu goes to the Falcons. Dallas Turner to Chicago. Roma Dunzier, he's going with the Jets. Amarius Mims goes to New York. Everybody wants that kid. Jared Verse goes to to um, to Denver. Fuwaga is with the Raiders. Latu is with the is fourteenth. Is lot is Liatu Latu? Is that the guy that uh, Stoutland really wants? Liatu Latu was that his name? King Nine Mitchell is staying at. Everything else is pretty much the same. Brian Thomas, Nate Wiggins, uh, or is that Fountainu? Johnny Wilson, wide right receiver, six foot seven. That's the other guy he was talking about because I said Keon Cole, but that's the other guy that they were talking about. You know what? I watched the scout of him by um by um Steve Smith, and Steve Smith said that he wasn't crazy about him. So we miss we miss Fountainu by two picks. Pittsburgh picks him up. And then uh, Miami gets the other offensive tackle, J.C. Latham. So we're back again. Now this time, uh, the top pick available is Terry and Arnold from Alabama. He's too lightweight for me, 5'11", 189. So he'll be 180 by the time he gets to camp. Um, Cooper DeGene is still available. Uh, let me see. Tyler Guyton is the best offensive tackle still available. Um, but again, I'm gonna go with my own wishes and I'm gonna go Cooper DeGene, even though they got other people ranked ahead of him. So now we got pick 50. We're gonna keep pick 50. I'm gonna keep this status quo. I'm not gonna make any trades on this one. Uh, Braylon Trice, we're at pick 50. Um, oh, so let's go. I'm going back defense and I'm gonna see which linebackers we got. Peyton Wilson is available, Cedric Gray is available, Junior Colson is available. Um, our next pick is 53. Our next pick is 53, so we got 50 and 53. So I think what I'm going to do is we got Cooper DeGene first. I'm going to get that offensive tackle. Patrick Paul out of Houston. Chop is still on the board, I think. Cedric Gray. No, I take that back. Um, Green Bay got Get Edron Cooper. Who got shot? Um, let me see. Yeah, Chop is gone, but I can't see. I don't know who took him. Bo Nix, Edron Cooper. Let 
Lab McConkey went. Keon Cole went. Keon Coleman went 30. Chop Robinson went to New York at 23. So I'm going to take the kid from Iowa, Iowa State. He is ranked much higher than Rosengarten. So I'm going to take him. Now we're back at 53. Now I'm going to go back and get my linebacker. Peyton Wilson's still available. Cedric Gray is still available. Junior Colson, Jeremiah Trotter Jr., Trevin Wallace out of Kentucky. So even at our, this is what, our third pick? So now we're down to, now we're at 53 in the second round, and we got good linebackers available. So I am going to take, I'm going to take Peyton Wilson, man. Kid out of NC State. Dude, we already got edges. That's why I'm not so 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 gung ho on just drafting another edge. That's why we paid uh Bryce Huff. So he'll pick that he'll 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 stay at that spot. I'm gonna reject that trade. Um we will go defense. Now you got uh Jalex Hunt. I've been hearing his name before, Javon Solomon. Jalex Hunt, 6'3, 250. He's a hybrid. Jonah Ellis, Cedric Johnson. Cedric Johnson popped up again from Ole Miss. Javon Solomon, six foot. He's too small. But I will take uh, the best available, so I'm going to go Jayla Tunt. DeAndre Pierce. Now, so all right, so right now we got Cooper DeGene, Patrick Paul, uh, Peyton Wilson at linebacker, Jalex Hunt at edge, and now we're at pick 161. Um, Isaac Garendo, that's that kid from Louisville that was like six foot 220 and ran a 4 3 at the combine. He was impressive. Um, I'm going to take Ladarius Henderson from Michigan. He's an offensive guard. You talking about that running back from Louisville? Yeah, he's pretty good. And it's funny because I, he doesn't look. He ran a four. He ran a four four three at the combine, which is impressive at two twenty. Garendo, yeah. He transferred from Wisconsin, right? He's a transfer. Um, but I watched some of his tape, and he wasn't like as flashy. He's a he's a downhill runner. He is a downhill runner, uh, physical guy. Um, but if you give him a little bit of space, you know, he'll kick it into fifth gear and, and run away from you. So, but he wasn't like a, a bouncy guy. I thought he would he would have a little bit more flash somebody that his size running that fast but now nah, he's a he's a guy he's a third and short type guy he's gonna hit the hole and hit the hole hard so he's somebody that you know dbs are coming up they are definitely making business decisions with him so i like garendo um if he's around a little bit later i'll scoop him up he could be our fourth running back um <clears throat> I got Ladarius Henderson. So now we are at pick 171 and we got pick 210. So right now we got a safety, offensive tackle, linebacker, edge, offensive guard. Um, I'm going to get Jalen Coker still available. Ladeatric Griffin. Good grief, these names, man. These names sound like Key and Peel skits. Jalen Coker. Holy Cross. That's the second time I've got a chance to get him. And then our final pick of the night, I will go running back. And I'll pick up Garendo. 
So that's a good haul. Cooper DeGene, uh, Patrick Paul, Peyton Wilson, Jalex Hunt, D Ladarius Henderson, Jalen Coker, Is Isaac Garendo. Oh, we got one more pick at 210. Um, and let's go just to booster the roster. Let's get let's pick up Logan Lee from uh Iowa defensive tackle. And that should round us off for this one. So this was a good one, man. Definitely a good one. So again, if all you people are still on uh Twitter, do me a favor and uh join me on Facebook. I mean, I'm sorry, join me on YouTube if you could, please. I'd appreciate it. Got all these people on Twitter. I gotta figure out how to there's gotta be a better way to, to do that. So but in any case, uh, this was a good one. I am going to download this one. I'm going to post this on my Twitter feed because I like this one. So we're going to download that. You guys want to do one more before we get up out of here? We can do one more. All right, we're going to do one more. And this is... Can you guys hear me? Unplug my mic by mistake. Sorry about that. All right, we're gonna do one more. Um, I'm gonna save that one and let's go back. All seven rounds fast. There we go. Solo draft. Let's get it on and popping. Let's see what we got. All right, let's do one more before we get up out of here. All right, so let's um take into consideration everything. So right now, uh, we are at pick 22. New England wants to trade with us. New England wants to give us, drop us back to pick 34 um, and pick 68. I do not want to do that because I do not want to get out of the first round. No. All right. So we are at pick 22. What are we going with? I'm going to go Cooper available cornerback so we can go you got the best of both words uh best of both worlds here you got kool-aid mckinstry or you got cooper DeGene. <laughs> fact marius <laughs> nice <laughs> All right, who who do we want? Do we want to get Kool Aid McKinstry, or do you want to do you want Cooper DeGene? I vote Cooper DeGene because he is a hybrid, and you can play him at a couple different positions. So, so I'm gonna go. I'll make that decision. Cooper DeGene all the way. Now we are at uh, pick 53. So Arizona wants to trade with us. They want our 50th pick in our two. 210 pick and they want to give us 66 and 90 and i will reject that um the browns want to give us pick 54 and pick 206 i'm going to take that one because we don't move back too much reject reject all right and of course the browns get edger and cooper <laughs> That's okay. Peyton Wilson is still available and Cedric Gray. So I'm going to take Peyton Wilson. I, I can live with that. And we got another pick. So now let's do offense. Who do I have? Cooper, Peyton Wilson, and Patrick Paul. I like that. Yeah, Jason, I'm with you, man. If we can get DeGene, I'm I'm happy with DeGene. Uh right now we're at pick 120. Um and so far this last draft, we got Cooper DeGene, Peyton Wilson, and Patrick Paul offensive tackle. So right now we got safety, linebacker, offensive tackle, 
And what's next? You want to go? You want to get another edge? Jalen Hunt pops up again. The tackle, uh, Makai Wingo from LSU. That might be a good pick. He's kind of small though, only six foot two eighty four. <clears throat> Torque <laughs> <Torque> Lewis. <laughs> All right, who we got? Um, you want to look at offensive guard? Brandon Coleman pops up again at one twenty. Um. Let's see. I'm going to go offensive guard. We can get that out the way. And then we're going to go right back to defense. And I think now I'm going to take the kid out of Clemson at defensive tackle. And now for my 171, I'm going to go with an edge. Uh, Fatui out of Washington. Zion to Fatui. Brendan Jackson is available, but I think I'm going to go this kid. 6'2", 244. Uh, so his skill set that jumps on you sudden. Mm. I don't know. This kid is injury prone. I'm going to stick with him, though. Wide receiver three. Got you. Who we got? Jaquan Jackson from Tulane. Uh, he's too small. 6'2", 212, Cornelius Johnson. Size, speed, threat. Four-star recruit, 4'5", 840. Um, I can dig that. I like the big receivers, man. Go up and get it. Go up and get the ball. Um, 206. I'm going to get an edge. Brennan Jackson, always available. And 210. Um, we got one more pick. What are we looking at? Last pick. Last pick of this mock. Right now we got uh, Cooper DeGene, safety. Peyton Wilson, linebacker. Patrick Paul, offensive tackle. Brendan Coleman, offensive guard. Tyler Davis, a defensive tackle. Zion uh, uh, Tupuola, Tupuola Fatui. He is the edge. Cornelius Johnson is a receiver, and Brennan Jackson is another edge. So we our last pick of the day should go where? Running back? Look at the running backs again. Carson Steele. Carson Steele's Imani Bailey, Dylan Johnson, Kendall Milton from Georgia. I'm going to go Carson Steele again. George Halani, Boise State. All right, we're good. Last one is the best one, right? Last one is the best one. All right, I'm going to say this one again. We're going to be done. I'm going to post these on my uh, Twitter feed. So, but yeah, man, good conversation tonight with Ian. Um, he's got a lot of information, man. That dude is just oozing with information and film study. So, matter of fact, let me make myself a, let me do that right now uh, in the Twitterverse. Let me jump on and let me thank. Let me thank Ian. Let me see. Let's Much appreciated. I'm going to put all of these clips in Opus Clips and play all this stuff again because this was awesome. But yeah, man, that was a good night. Uh, Bob, I appreciate you, brother. Um, you know what? I meant I got lost in the shuffle, man, because I meant to ask that question. Um, who was that? Dave? Yeah. I meant to ask that question, and I just totally forgot about it. 
Totally forgot about. But um, yeah, got three drafts in. Got a good conversation with Ian. Uh, and that's what's up, man. I appreciate all you guys joining me. Um, don't forget, <laughs> if anybody in here is interested in Australian basketball, I will be live streaming the NBL, NASCO, National Basketball League, um, tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. My nephew, Randy Bell, is playing with the Goldfields Giants. Uh, over in Australia. So he's doing his thing, living his basketball dream. Uh, you know me, a veteran of the World League. I'm all for it, man. I'm all for it. Do what you got to do, nephew. So I will be live streaming his basketball game from Australia tomorrow. Uh, Jason Sink, uh, am I covering the Masters? You know what? Probably not. Probably not. I might watch a little bit of it because I know Tiger Woods is, is looks like he's getting healthy. But we'll see. Um, but I will be, um, I'll be doing tomorrow, the game tomorrow, the basketball game tomorrow. And then Monday, I will most likely be live streaming the WNBA draft. Cause I want to see how that's going to go. So, uh, that, those have been some interesting conversations. I'm working on some content about the WNBA and how they treat the players and just the influx of all of the money that they are about to get with this Caitlin Clark thing coming, coming, coming in there. So a um, lot of good stuff tonight, man. Hope you guys have a good weekend. I was worried that uh, I might lose my connection because uh, right before I went on, not five minutes before I went on, like the heavens opened up. Jason, I don't know where you are. I don't know if it was raining over there where you are, but it was cats and dogs down here, man. And the, and the, the wind was crazy. So, Glad we got that through. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to get up out of here, man. I appreciate everybody for joining me, man. Everybody in the Facebooks, uh, Dave Gates, you've always been there. Uh, William Chili Wilkinson just popped in. Uh, John Royston, John Malmos. Um, Gordy Glantz has been been a regular the last couple of days. I appreciate you guys. Mike Gardea. Um yeah, man, I appreciate all you guys joining me on Facebook. Everybody in Twitter, I appreciate y'all. Man, y'all y'all are bringing in the noise today in the Twitter space. Um, and, of course, everybody here on YouTube, Jason Sink, my guy, Bob Brown, Val316, <laughs> Torque Lewis. <laughs> uh, um, who else? Uh, Cody K. I know he's in there. Um yeah, man, I appreciate all the love. We had a we had a lit lit group tonight. The chat was lit, and we still growing, man. So you know the rules. Bow three one six. Um, everybody jumping in, man. So I appreciate you guys, and you guys know the rules. Uh, bring somebody else next time. All right, let's spread the word so I can keep grinding and growing, man. I hope you guys will join me tomorrow morning. If not, have a great weekend, and I will see you guys on Monday. All right. Go Birds.